she was not a young woman given to much thanksgiving and generally spent her time bewailing what she did not have rather than in being glad over what she had escaped presently the lack of a maid who was to her a necessary institution began to make itself felt her aunt had servants she knew for they had been mentioned occasionally in the long letters she wrote at stated intervals to them her father had most emphatically declared against taking a maid with her from new york this had been one of her greatest grievances her father said that her aunt had all the servants that would be necessary to wait upon her and it was high time she learned to do things for herself all her tears and protestations had not availed but in this house there had been no word of a maid mrs gray had told her to let her know if there was anything she needed but had not suggested sending a servant of course they must have servants she would investigate she looked about her for signs of a bell but no bell appeared she opened the door and listened there was the distant tinkle of china and silver as of someone setting a table there came a tempting whiff of something savory through the hall and distant voices talking low and pleasantly but there seemed to be no servant anywhere in sight or sound across the hall mrs gray's wide old-fashioned room seemed to smile peacefully at her and speak of a life she did not understand and into which she had never had a glimpse before it annoyed her now she did not care for it it seemed to demand a depth of earnestness beneath living that was uncomfortable she knew not why she went in and slammed her door again and sat down on the bay window seat looking out discontentedly across the lawn presently a wagon drove into the yard carrying her two large trunks she heard voices about the door and then the heavy tread of a man bearing a burden she waited thinking how she could get hold of a servant Allison's light tap on the door soon followed, and behind her was the man with the trunk on his shoulder. Well, I can tell you that their trunk ain't filled with feathers, ejaculated the man as he put down the trunk with a thump and looked shrewdly at its owner. You ought to bring someone to help you, Mr. Carter, said Allison's fresh, clear voice, with just a tinge of indignation in it as she looked toward the stranger. That was entirely too much of a lift for you miss rutherford curled her lips and turned toward the window till the colloquy should be concluded and now said mr carter puffing and blowing from the weight of the second trunk which was even worse than the first i s'pose you want them there things unstropped you don't look like you was much more fit to do it yourself than one of those here grasshoppers or a good-sized butterfly sir said miss rutherford in freezing astonishment i said as how you wa'n't built for unstroppin trunks remarked the amiable carter with his foot against the top of the trunk and his cheeks puffed out in the effort to unfasten a refractory buckle your remarks are entirely unnecessary said the haughty young woman straightening herself to her full height and looking disagreeable in the extreme the buckle gave way and carter taking his old hat from the floor where it had fallen looked at her slowly and carefully from head to foot his face growing redder than when he had first put down the trunk no arm meant i'm sure miss he said in deep embarrassment as he shuffled away mumbling something under his breath as he went downstairs the idea said the young woman to herself what impudence he ought not to be employed by decent people then she heard Allison's step in the hall and remembered her wants. Will you please let your maid bring me some hot water? She said with a sweet imperiousness she knew how to assume on occasion. I will attend to it at once, answered Allison in a cold tone, and it became evident to the guest that her sympathies were all with Mr. Carter. It made her indignant, and she retired to her room to await the hot water she stood before the mantel idly studying a few photographs one the face of a young man scarcely more than a boy attracted her with an oddly familiar glance where had she seen someone who had that same peculiarly direct gaze that awakened a faint stir of undefined pleasant memories she turned from the picture without having discovered 
to answer the tap on the door with a come that was meant as a pleasant preface to her request that the entering maid would assist her a little and met allison with the hot water oh how kind to bring it yourself said the guest a trifle less stiffly than before would you mind lending me your maid for a few minutes can you spare her i won't keep her very long the color crept into allison's cheeks as she answered steadily i am very sorry to say that we are without any just now so i cannot possibly send her to you but i shall be glad to help you in any way i can as soon as mother can spare me oh indeed said the guest with one of her stares don't trouble yourself i shall doubtless get along in some way and she turned her back upon allison and looked haughtily out of the window allison reflected a moment and said in a pleasanter tone if there is any lifting to be done or your trunks are not right father will help you when he comes in for supper and i'm sure mother would want me to help you in any way i can if you will just tell me what to do would you like me to help you unpack oh no thank you said the guest with her face still toward the window i can do very well myself allison hesitated and then turned to go as she was half out of the door she said helplessly we have supper in half an hour if you want me just call i can easily hear you miss rutherford made no answer after the door had closed she began elaborate preparations for a dinner toilet she belonged to a part of the world that considers it a crime to appear at dinner in anything but evening attire in her life atmosphere it was thought to be a part of the unwritten code of culture which must be adhered to in spite of circumstances as one would wear clothes even if thrown among naked savages in her eyes hillcroft was somewhat of a cannibal island but it never occurred to her that it would be proper for her to do as the savages did therefore she dressed for dinner it was decidedly over an hour from that time before the guest descended mr gray had waited as patiently as possible though he had pressing engagements for the evening the bell rang twice loud and clear and allison tapped at her door once and asked politely if she could be of any assistance as supper was ready but in spite of all this the guest came into the dining-room as coolly as if she had not been keeping every one waiting for at least three-quarters of an hour and spoiling most effectually the roasted potatoes which had been in their perfection when the bell rang mrs gray had been as much annoyed by the delay as she ever allowed herself to be over anything for she did like to have potatoes roasted to just the right turn and prided herself upon knowing the instant to take them from the oven and crack their brown coats till the steam burst forth and showed the snowy whiteness of the dry delicious filling but potatoes and engagements alike were forgotten when miss rutherford burst upon them in her glory she had chosen a costume which in her estimation was plain but which by its very unexpectedness was somewhat startling it was only a black net with spangles of jet in delicate traceries and intricate patterns here and there but the dazzling whiteness of the beautiful neck and arms in contrast made it very effective she certainly was a beautiful girl and she saw their acknowledgment of this fact in their eyes as she entered the room but she could not know of the shock which the bare white shoulders and beautifully moulded arms gave to the whole family hillcroft was not a place where decollete dressing was considered just quite the thing among the older well-established families it was felt to be a little fast by the best people and it happened that allison had never in the whole of her quiet sheltered life sat down to a table or even moved about familiarly in the same room with a woman who considered it quite respectable to use so little material in the waist of her dress it shocked her indescribably she could scarcely understand herself why it should have such an effect upon her she was a girl who had read widely and in the world of literature she had moved much in the society of women who dressed in this way and so far as one can be through books she was used to society's ways but she had moved through that airy world of the mind without even noticing this feature of the fashions except to disapprove of them because her parents did 
now she looked for the first time upon a beautiful woman standing unblushing before her father in a costume that his own daughter would have thought immodest to wear in his presence after the first startled look allison turned away her face it was a beautiful vision but one that she felt ought not to be looked upon it seemed that the girl before her must be shielded in some way and the only way she could do it was by averting her gaze if allison had been a frequenter of the theatre she would not have felt in this way but hillcroft was not a place where many artists penetrated and if it had been mr gray disapproved of the theatre and so did his wife the feeling which allison had about the white neck and arms extended in a less degree to her mother and father there was a tinge of embarrassment in their greeting as they sat down to the evening meal which they could hardly have explained it was not so much embarrassment for themselves as for their guest for they felt that she must inevitably discover how out of place she was in such surroundings and then what could she feel but confusion they forgot that her home surroundings had not been theirs End of chapter two Chapter Three of An Unwilling Guest by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Like Many Waters. Chapter Three The Maid of All Work. It was well for the Gray family that their custom was to drop their eyes and bow their heads upon sitting down to a meal, while the head of the house asked God's blessing on this occasion it was a relief to all concerned to close their eyes and quiet their hearts before god for a brief instant they were people who lived close enough to their heavenly father to gather strength from even so brief a heart lift as was this as for the guest it was actually the first time since her little girlhood that she had sat at a table and heard god's blessing asked there could scarcely have been brought together two girls whose lives had been farther apart than those of Alison Gray and Evelyn Rutherford. Miss Rutherford slightly inclined her head as good breeding would dictate, but she kept her eyes wide open and looked about on the group. Half amused and a trifle annoyed, she did not care to have such an interruption to her little triumph of entrance. Besides, she now thought she knew why these people were so awfully placid and unusual in their behavior. They were religious. She had never known any very religious people, but she felt sure they were disagreeable, and she decided again to get away from them as soon as possible. Meantime, she was hungry, and she could not help seeing that a tempting meal was set before her. Even though, in the housekeeper's notion, it was almost spoiled. When the blessing was concluded, she noticed, as she waited for the plate containing a piece of juicy steak to be handed to her, that the tablecloth was fine and exquisitely ironed, and that the spoons and forks, though thin and old-fashioned, were solid silver. She happened to be interested in old silver just then, on account of a fad of a city friend, so she was able to recognize it. This fact made the people rise somewhat in her estimation and she set herself to be very charming to the head of the house. It had never seemed to her worth while to exercise her charms upon women. She really could talk very well. Allison had to admit that, as she sat quietly, serving the delicious peaches and cream, and passing honey, delicate biscuits, and amber coffee with the lightest of sponge cake. The guest did thorough justice to the evening meal and talked so well about her journey to Mr. Gray that he quite forgot his hurry, and suddenly looked at his watch to find that he was already five minutes late to a very important committee meeting. Allison did not fail to note all these things, nor to admit the beauty and charm of their visitor as she from time to time cast furtive glances, getting used to the dazzling display of white arms. Her face grew grave as the meal drew to a close, and her mother watching partly understood they had just risen from the table when mrs gray stepping softly from the hall folded a white fleecy shawl about the guest's shoulders saying gently now dear you must go out and watch the moon rise over the lawn and you will need this wrap it is very cool outside 
Allison noticed with vexation that the shawl was her mother's carefully guarded best one that her brother had sent last Christmas. Allison herself always declined to wear it that it might be safe for mother. Yet here was this disagreeable, haughty, hateful. Allison stopped suddenly and tried to devote herself to clearing off the supper table, realizing that her state of mind was not charitable, to say the least. She went with swift feet and skillful fingers about the work of washing the supper dishes, and her mother, perhaps thinking it was just as well for Allison to have a quiet thinking time, did not offer to help, but sat on the piazza with their guest, talking quietly to her about her aunt, though she must have noticed that the girl did not respond very heartily, nor seem much interested. By and by, Allison slipped out with another shawl and wrapped it about her mother, and the stranger saw in the moonlight the mother's grateful smile and the lingering pressure she gave Allison's hand, and, wondering, felt for the first time in her life a strange lack in her own existence. "'Are the dishes all washed, dear?' said Mrs. Gray a little while later, when Allison came out and settled at her mother's feet on the upper step. "'Yes, mother, and I have started the oatmeal for breakfast. You wanted oatmeal, didn't you?' During the few words that followed about domestic arrangements, it became evident to Miss Rutherford that the other girl had actually washed the supper dishes and done a good deal of the work of the house that day. She looked at her with curiosity and not a little sympathy. She felt a lofty pity for any girl who did not move amid the pleasures of society, but to be obliged to wash dishes seemed to the New York girl a state not far from actual degradation. And yet here was this girl, talking about it as composedly as if it were an everyday occurrence which she did not in the least mind. She wondered what could be the cause of the necessity for this state of things. Probably all the servants had decamped at once. It might be on account of the fear of smallpox. In that case, it might be that even she was in danger of contagion. It would be well to investigate. Mrs. Gray had gone into the house, and Allison sat on the step, quietly looking out at the shadows on the lawn. "'You said your maid had left you, I think,' said Miss Rutherford, trying to speak pleasantly. "'Have all your servants gone? What was the matter? Were they afraid of the smallpox?' "'Oh, dear, no,' said Allison, this time surprised out of her gravity into a genuine laugh. "'There isn't any smallpox in town.' only perhaps that one case you know no we never keep more than one servant i did not say she had left i said we had none now she's not a maid in the sense you meant she's the maid of all work she has been with mother since we were little children but she is away on vacation now she always goes for a month every fall to visit her brother in chicago and during that month mother and i do all the work all but the washing she only went to Chicago day before yesterday, so we are just getting broken in, you see. Oh, said Miss Rutherford slowly, trying to take in such a state of things and the possibility that anybody could accept it calmly. And you only keep one servant? I'm sure I don't see how ever in the world you manage. Why, we keep four always, and sometimes five. And then things are never half done right. I should think you would just hate to have to do the work, don't you? Why, no, said Allison slowly. I rather like it. Mother and I have such nice times doing it together. I love to make bread. I always do that part. It's a little too hard for Mother. Do you mean to say you can make bread? The questioner leaned forward and looked curiously at the other girl, as though she had confessed to belonging to some strange tribe of wild people of whom she had heard but whom she had never expected to look upon. Why, certainly, said Allison, laughing heartily now. I can make good bread, too, I think. Wasn't that good you had for supper? Yes, it was fine. I think it was the best I ever ate, but I never dreamed a girl could make it. Don't you get your hands all stuck up? I should think it would ruin them forever. I've always heard work was terrible on the hands. And she looked down at her own white ones sparkling with jewels in the moonlight, as if they might have become contaminated by those so lowly nearby. I have not found that my hands suffered, said Allison in a cold tone. 
spreading out a pair as small and white and shapely as those adorned with rings. Her guest looked at her curiously again. Sitting there on the step in that graceful attitude, with the white scarf about her head and shoulders, which her mother had placed there when she went in, and the moonlight streaming all about her, Miss Rutherford suddenly saw that the other girl was beautiful too. The delicately cut features showed clearly with a pure line of profile against the dark foliage and shadow behind her. Evelyn Rutherford knew that here was a face that her brother would rave over as being pure Greek. What a pity that such a girl must be shut in by such surroundings, a little quiet village wherein she was buried, and nothing to do but wash dishes and make bread. Curiosity began to grow in her. She would try to find out how this other girl reconciled herself to such surroundings. Did she know no better, or had she never heard of any other world, of life and gaiety? What did she do with her time? She decided to find out. What in the earth do you do with yourself the rest of the time? You only have to wash dishes and make bread one month, you say. I should think you would die buried away out here. Is there any life at all in this little place? If Allison had been better acquainted with her visitor, she would have known that her tone was as near true pity as she had ever yet come in speaking to another girl. As it was, she recognized only a scornful curiosity, and it seemed an indignity put upon her home and her upbringing. She grew suddenly angry, and with her habit of self-control waited a moment before she answered. Her questioner studied her meanwhile, and wondered at the look that gradually overspread her face. She had lifted her eyes for steadying to the brilliant autumn skies, studded with innumerable stars. Did they speak to her of the Father in heaven whom she recognized, of his wealth and power, and all the glories to which she was heir? Did it suddenly come to her how foolish it was that she should mind the pity of this other girl, whose lot was set indeed amid earthly pleasures, but whose hope for the future might be so lacking? For suddenly the watcher saw a look almost of triumph.